Haiku is a Japanese style of poem. You've all probably heard of it before. Um, the classic oh, what is five syllable, seven syllable, five syllable structure. Um, usually about nature, usually basically just a setting description or a description of something like a small action that happens in nature. Sometimes a few poems, a few haiku will like tell a longer story. Like someone might tell a story using like 10 haiku. Um, but traditionally it was just like one very small moment captured in 14 syllables, 17 syllables. Um, <laughs> this is not so, a math podcast. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> We don't care about structure. <laughs> we don't. A um, few notes is that <laughs> um, these poets that we have here are Japanese. They wrote their poems in Japanese. And so the 575 situation will probably not happen a lot of the time. Because while it has that many syllables in Japanese, to translate it puts it out of that pattern Usually. Sometimes the translators are really good and can make it happen, but often not. Honestly, it's amazing when they do. Yeah. Especially when they can capture the meaning, too. Um, Matsuo Bashu, which I butchered, um, is from... Hey. Okay, thanks. The 1600s. Um, considered the greatest haiku poet. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that is it. An old silent pond. A frog jumps into the pond. Splash! Silence again. Mm. And in silent pond, a frog jumps into the pond. Splash! Silence again. Wow, they did it. They did it. Oh, these madmen did it. <laughs> I got the syllables right. So, do we discuss it now? Is that how we do it? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's how we've been doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 that's, that's the podcast yeah that's the last um, the last 11 months or so <laughs> <laughs> oh we're a podcast oh whoa wait <laughs> wait oh, the, what's that tiny talking? red recording button doing <laughs> what, is, what is this thing what is this youtube what <laughs> like oh hey, let me see um i I like them because they are not too complicated. I think it's just like something about the simplicity. You can kind of mm. see like the pond in your head. You can hear the frog jumping in and like feel the peace of the silence. It's all very sensory. Um, you kind of get the calmness without them having to try too hard, so to speak, like without them having to inundate you with like 30 lines of poetry. <laughs> yeah. It kind of reminds me of... Like, at the very least, this one, because it, it feels like it's rising and falling, and it feels like an inhale and an exhale, and it makes me think of, like, square breathing, where you, like, breathe in, and then hold it, and then you exhale, because it's, like, five, seven, and then five, exhale. Mm -hmm. I like that. And in this one, the middle line is when the action happens, so, like, the two, like, bookend lines are, like silence and then mm. action and then silence and so it's like breath pause breath mm. that is cool that's really interesting like this this translation changes the meaning a lot in a weird way because it actually is supposed to end at splash mm. there's actually no silence again in the original one that's uh i guess they made it into mm. five syllables mm -hmm. Though there's an implication of there being silence again. Like the original one is like old pond, frog jumps, sound of water. Mm. And I think that's just supposed to like imply some level of disturbance in what was balance. Mm. But I guess like how do I say it? The disturbance is something small and there's only really like a residual of the disturbance rather than an actual you don't see the consequence of it but only the butterfly effect of it i think mm -hmm. that's what it was supposed to say i forgot i saw this in the museum a while ago i forgot the actual story behind this but there's like a whole story behind it but but i can kind of see it like in classical music when you finish a piece mm -hmm. and you like hold mm -hmm. for like 
a few seconds and then mm. so it's like splash and then you like feel the ripples and then mm. it's like, mm. that's, that's a nice that. interpretation I like, I think you remember, when i went to the museum with my students my adult students they told me that because of the period this was written in but let me check the dates again this might be a reference to yeah so 1686 um this might be a reference to a historical change in japan where something really big happened and then the system changed but this is before japan closing so this might be the first time japan interacted with the outside world roughly it might be a reference to Japan just being an island, untouched, and never really interacting with anything. And then a sailor or a visitor comes and changes the whole culture and changes their whole understanding. Mm, and splash. then a splash of water. Exactly. And then it's rippled throughout, as Ellison was saying. Because mm. Japan really changed after that. Maybe. I don't fully remember. <laughs> Maybe. No, it's all right. I mean, that's that's the um, beauty of poetry. And I think that that's why haiku are so powerful is you can get so many mm -hmm. different interpretations out of so small of a piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've talked sure. before about like how important the translator is to foreign mm -hmm. to works written in foreign languages um, mm -hmm. because it can really change the whole thing, change the whole meaning of the poem. Absolutely. Because like when you say silence again, this translation, I find just that last part really does change it quite a bit. Because I, how do I say it? it's kind of like the other poems like to be continued. Da, na, 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 na. But then this one's like more round, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like this has an ending. The other one didn't. The other one was just like this happened. <laughs> You know what I also I also really like about it that like at, in the the first line and the last line both is silence, but the silence feels so different because of what came in between, and like that probably really speaks to kind of like external forces coming into Japan and changing it. And even though it's the same, it's also different. It's mm -hmm. like the water settles. It's the same pond as before. It looks the same as before, but like. Now we know there's a frog in there and it's different because we know that. It can never be the same pond again. And I wonder like the people, not the people, obviously, the creatures that are in the pond, their lives have changed because they might get eaten by this frog. Um, and now there's like a dangerous force in here probably to a lot of those little creatures. And so like, it looks the same to us on the outside of the pond, mm -hmm. but in the pond, mm -hmm. things are much different. Or, like, is the frog going to get eaten by something else in the pond? Mm -hmm. That's also true. That's also true. Like, hidden like, depths. Ooh. Hidden depths, bro. <laughs> it might be a pond, but it goes deep. It's uh, a well. It's a well. See, that's like, that. I think that's an interesting point. Where, like, you know, it is really just that disturbance, and you don't know what happened. You just know that it was disturbed. And it's mm -hmm. almost like a Pandora's box kind of thing. Like, once it happens, it happens. And now we're just there, if that makes sense. Like, there's just a... Um, let's call it like an evidence of it, have, of it having had happened. Is that right, English? Of it having had happened. Mm -hmm. That is a weird sentence, but it makes sense. <laughs> okay. Of it having it happened. Yeah, of it having happened. Of it having happened? There's evidence of it having happened. That it happened? There's evidence of it <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And there's some level of visual or like some kind of perceivable side to it. But as a frog jumping into a pond, there's very little evidence, but there is still a perceived side to it, which was the sound, which I don't really know what Japanese people consider the imagery of sound to be. I've seen many versions of it from like, sounds are nature's way of communicating with us to like sound samurai uses thunder sword to kill someone like you know i've seen every version of this sound reference i'm not entirely sure it's supposed to have some level of meaning the fact that they didn't mention the ripple but they mentioned the sound of the water mm -hmm. i cannot remember i can't remember what the meaning was i was thinking that it feels very zen 
to like mm-hmm. contemplate the stillness of water and everything that might be going on underneath it. But then I also feel like it's very Zen to like view yourself as a still pool and like things that you take in kind of cause those ripples and it takes time to integrate them. But then they kind of just become a part of the greater pool and the greater like understanding of the universe. And then you're like still and at peace. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like this is a very therapist. Well, maybe I'm just, I don't know if it's a therapist way of thinking or like me as a therapist way of thinking, (laughs) but it's like, you know, we take in so much information all the time and like change is something that is really unsettling. And when we have to kind of take in new information and integrate it and change, it can cause a lot of turmoil. But ultimately, if we're able to like take that in and be still with it and like reflect on it, then we're able to find that like peace again. I like that. So, I see, I see. So you have a certain baseline of peace. And if there's a disturbance, your piece is broken, but you can reestablish that piece. Like, yes, but then like you, it's different than it was before, but that's a good mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in and you know that that knowledge is there, mm-hmm. but then it's like part of you and your understanding of the world. Mm. I kind of like that. Cause like a lot of people, when they have a, a traumatic experience or something that really does disturb their worldview, it usually goes one of two ways where like they either overcome it, accept it and expand their worldview, which helps them mature or they get stuck in a different state in an earlier state. And then they don't find that balance. Sometimes right. It's like either it exceeds your resources to overcome or mm-hmm. like it exceeds your resources to like weather that storm or post-traumatic growth. Right. Which frankly, like, I, I don't want to say this in a dumb way, but like best kind of growth. Like it really does, really does boost someone to the next level of maturity, if that makes sense. Not that maturity is like a hierarchy, but you know, if you don't have this kind of disturbance in your life, it is hard to grow because why grow? It, yeah, it's important to have challenges that exist within the threshold of what you're able to overcome. And when those challenges like exceed that threshold, that's why we need like, actual good resources for supporting people through their challenges when a frog enters your body what do you do what do you do what do you do (laughs) you're probably gonna be sick (laughs) (laughs) i mean the thing is like this poem was obviously in like pre-1700s so i'm pretty sure this frog was a literal frog in this guy's image but if we were to like take it to current day this exact, how do I say it? Like visualization. Is the frog the virus? The frog is the virus. <laughs> well, yeah, no, this is like a valid thing. Um, you can like apply stuff, uh, literature to things that the author could not have possibly known um, mm. about, you know, like um, there have been people who applied like Freudian thought to older mm. novels and then being been like oh wow like this is this perfectly follows his you know idea but it's like they could not have possibly known about freud you know um there's no way <laughs> or like reading um for instance like the great gatsby as like an aids metaphor it's like aids was not a thing right. when great gatsby was written <laughs> but it can work you know if you like whatever, this is not a real thing. It may be, actually, it probably is. I don't know. Anyway, so you could apply <laughs> this to, like, the coronavirus or mm-hmm. maybe, like, the bomb. Um, <laughs> um, things I mean, like that. That, but... that is one of the things that came to me. Yeah. Like, in a weird way, like, I wouldn't call Japan a silent, po- a silent pond before the bomb. It was mm-hmm. shooting for world domination. But yes. then the bomb did change Japan indefinitely. So I guess like I have to look at it from the Japan perspective because when we think about the bomb is Japan. But it is kind of strange how like, I mean, a frog in general is considered a predator of small insects. So and it small does islands. Small islands, just like picking them off. Like, look, look, look. Mm. So, you know, when a frog does enter a asylum pond, the frog does actually completely disrupt the habitat that was developed there. And as a dominant dominant species, usually, is what I, I assume. I'm not 
frog biologist, but you know, that's my image of what a frog is. <laughs> and you know, like, I was just like trying to find the interpretation that my students told me, but I couldn't find it. But I found something interesting where someone made this as a reference to globalism and the internet, where the world was silent with mm -hmm. a lot of you know, small things happening, small worries. But now that everything is globalized, now there is just this echoing sound. It came like a splash, and now there's sound <laughs> of people. Just the, the fact that they, now they can reach each other. I kind of like that interpretation as now that, especially since like the news is kind of ridiculous now compared to before, less controlled, obviously, which is in a lot of ways good. But now there's just this like white noise of world events and every day some new drama every day some new drama and there's like 35 frogs all jumping into this pond at the same time <laughs> right exactly or just yeah. one really big frog and <laughs> <laughs> just clogging it up <laughs> it's my image and big like frog <laughs> i like that you mentioned the internet because I think that a lot of my time on the internet is quite silent in a way. Like I read the news and like Facebook is like a silent activity and like, you know, stuff like that. Um, mm. Unless I actively put on a video, which would be similar to like TV, which is, you know, existed mm. before the internet. Like mm. um, it is like a silent loudness. Mm -hmm. Like there's all this stuff happening in my head, but from the outside, it doesn't look that different. That's actually interesting. Like, it is a bizarre type of behavior, right? I mean, reading a book is akin to that. Watching TV is akin to that. Where there is this loudness in our head just from the type of entertainment we consume that really does carry out to other sides of our lives, I think. Just because, like, you know, ADHD is a huge problem now. And I'm not going to claim that the internet, TikTok, is causing ADHD. Though it probably is to some people. But, you know, like... There is this loudness that's inside. On the outside, it seems so silent that we can't quiet. And obviously, I don't know the insides of the brains of people that didn't have this kind of stuff. But there's just so much things being filled, 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 filled. Just through, as I said, YouTube, TikTok, news, whatever you want to call it. That it has become really hard to silence your head, I find. Mm -hmm. Which, I don't know, maybe that's just crazy talk, but... <laughs> no, it's... I mean, I totally relate to that. Uh, it is kind of bizarre. Especially, like, now that there's... I kind of really hate Facebook's design. Just because it's too good. <laughs> just the scrolling, endless scrolling, is something that quiets any active part of my brain, but fills it with echoes of shit, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. just like reading a book is active when you read a book you're thinking you're reading you're contemplating you're imagining when you're mm -hmm. scrolling on the internet it is so passive even tv is more active than that and you're just there like zombieing out <laughs> and that i find sometimes i feel more stupid than i usually am after spending 10 minutes on facebook <laughs> i don't know if this is necessarily like a psychological study but like I can attest that, like, I will perform worse on an IQ test after I spend time on Facebook. That's and I'm not playing yeah. Facebook at all. That might just be me. But... A special segment where we do that. <laughs> uh, so... We should start giving more IQ tests. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been on Facebook? I feel like we haven't IQ roasted Muran enough. We need to <laughs> definitively test how smart he is. <laughs> oh my god, dude. <laughs> Yo, how is he even holding a phone right now? <laughs> Just mentioning <laughs> to get out to sit. <laughs> Part of it is your brain will like tune out things that are consistent because it wants to do as little work as possible. So if you're scrolling mm -hmm. through Facebook, your brain is like okay, well, all of these other things are the same, so I'm just going to not pay attention to anything for a while and just take in the minimal amount of information possible. And on mm -hmm. Facebook, that is very small. And mm -hmm. so then your brain, like, it gets lazy because it doesn't have to do much work. And then you, like, go out into the world and you're like, hey, could we, like, pay attention to all this other stuff? And it's like, mm. <laughs> No. 
Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And oh, that, yeah. that totally makes sense because, like, often I'll shut off a social media site and then, like, completely have no idea what I just looked at for like half an hour. You know. Um. Yeah. Or like. Because yeah. your brain yeah. all is the same, like. Or like I'll close it just doesn't, Facebook just and then the open it in fif- like five oh. seconds. I'll be like, oh, I haven't been on Facebook. It's like I literally just left. <laughs> oh, I know she was like, yeah. check for notifications, but it's not there. You check again, you're like, huh, oh. <laughs> and the yeah. notification, oh, someone posted something cool. The worst is like when I, I go to Facebook to like find someone's name or something like that. <laughs> And then, like, I end up scrolling, <laughs> and then why was I, I, here? <laughs> I never figured out what I needed to go for, and so then I have to log back on, and start again. <laughs> like, focus. and then it happens again. Like, focus, focus. <laughs> <laughs> like We're on a mission. <laughs> then a video pops up, you're out. Dude, they got trained like dogs, yeah. man. Not even dogs, rats. That's part of why online school and online work has been so hard for so many people is because you're like in the same room looking at the same thing for like your entire day, including your rest time. So like, even if you like, like if you're in online school and you have six classes a day, if in between your classes, you get up, walk outside of your room, stare, like just look around a different room for 30 seconds and then go back into your room. It's like a totally different experience. It is interesting, isn't it? Like brains are super cool. They're designed in such a way that they can do, they expend as little energy as possible for survival. Mm. They have a lot of survival mechanisms mm. that exist that are great for like, if you're trying to like hunt and gather and like mm-hmm. run away from saber two tigers or whatever, but mm. not so much in terms of like being able to access TikTok and still be functional at work. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> Like the, that kind of stuff really hits a primal brain and it constantly taps at it where there really isn't much we can do. It's just, you just have to avoid it. <laughs> you just have to avoid it. It is stronger than you. You won't lose the TikTok. <laughs> and you, oh my God. Like so unrelated to anything, but ever since YouTube started doing that, like mini TikTok things, like only clips, I never downloaded TikTok because I didn't want to touch it. But I totally see why kids are addicted to this. It is such easy consumable media at the perfect amount of time that really just gets it in you and then boom, you're washed out, you're clean. You're just kind of, your brain yeah. just restarts, reboots, reboots, reboots. Silence again. Mm. Silence again. Yeah, I gotta say, man. Yeah, I, it's interesting that you say that like online school is an issue. Like there's so many problems with online school just because of the way in which we use devices. Like, if we use computers as truly just a means to an end of getting information and getting work done, I think it would have worked fine. But when you're at your home and you're using the same computer you used to browse Facebook, play video games, do absolutely nothing, just like drag things around to actually get valuable information in your brain that you're going to get tested on, your brain just shortcuts it to be like, oh yeah, this is like, this is when I chill. <laughs> Your brain yeah. doesn't want to enter that yeah. mode. And a lot um, of people are doing school like in their beds too. So your brain's like, oh, it's sleepy time and YouTube time. Cool. I'm just going to come out for a while. And I've most seen, students apparently do watch that <laughs> during classes. <laughs> do do that. I've seen teachers at my yeah. school that had, um, they had assignment that required kids to go on Facebook. Like they would link to videos or not Facebook on YouTube. They would link to videos that like brought you to YouTube. And it was like, an educational video, but it's not blocked in any way from immediately getting you into the context of now I'm on YouTube. So I'm going to go to another video that I see because that's what you do when you're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you're saying is really true. It's like the context is so important when you have these mixed wires of this computer is for play and work. So now I have to like figure out what I'm doing and it's just like mental energy. Um, So like the, context of your location is wrong the context of the device is wrong and then your teacher just like gives you the context of literally the platform where you will get distracted mm. right. well it's rough too because i there's so much good stuff on youtube um like Absolutely. our videos like, for yeah. instance <laughs> <laughs> but, educational. yeah um 
but like it is difficult like I would show YouTube videos to my kids a lot stuff like this you know like educational whatever based on the things that we're reading but um I don't know that if you could help it I wouldn't suggest assigning it to kids at home just because like you get them on YouTube and now your next assignment like basically you're trying to be like all right you're already on YouTube I know that now get off YouTube and finish this homework assignment I don't think that's going to happen mm. <laughs> yeah problem no a lot of problems back to that. Yeah. I feel like so at least up. like huh. link oh. having it in like a private area. I feel like you can embed it, embed it, and not allow it to autoplay or like have links to other things. I don't know if that's an option, but no, no, it, there's is it should should be. Be. It's a video where it's just a video in like a black yeah. website, which is what teachers should do because like you don't know what recommended videos this kid gets like. You send a video about, like, I don't know, World War, but the kid's, like, <laughs> let's say far right <laughs> believer. <laughs> and then <laughs> you have a World War video, and on the side, a lot of things that contradict that. Probably yeah, not the great point. But a high schooler might be confused. I mean, the other thing I will say about, like, online school, and this is not relevant to the haiku at all, but, like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> in, in the context of hearing teletherapy... It takes a lot more brain power to stay focused on a teletherapy session, partly because a lot of I'm missing a lot of information. First of all, like I'm missing body language and tone of voice and a lot of the stuff that I normally get in a session. But I'm also my brain is like buffering for the teletherapy app. So like if there's lag, my brain has to process all of that information and put together the words. And sometimes it like drops words and sometimes it's like laggy. And when you're in a zoom call with like 30 kids, there's definitely lag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So kids are like, you know, especially like first and second graders whose brain who like can are already having a hard time paying attention in regular school, like expected to process things in that way. It's kind mm -hmm. of a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this year was kind of a bust. I think, I think everyone kind of knows that. <laughs> it sucks, but, <laughs> but I'm like tired out after a few teletherapy sessions. Like, I can go all day in person, but telehealth it takes so much more out of me. Mm. Mm. It's such such a big problem, especially with like a therapeutic context, like. <laughs> You can be on everything. Let's say you, you ask something and a kid gives an answer and you don't hear it. And if it was difficult for the kid to say, you're going to have to ask him to repeat himself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's pretty uncomfortable for a kid, I imagine. Especially in therapy, it's like, oh, I missed that traumatic detail. Repeat it again. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> well, also in therapy, it's terrible because like they're in their bedroom and their like sibling's bedroom is right next door. Their mm -hmm. parents are like listening at the door or whatever. And it's like... They can't share Mm. all right though we make it work y'all yeah, make it work i mean i gotta say man like certain things simply don't work over the internet that was one of the things that kind of annoyed me about like some people were like why don't we move all work online it's like no don't do that yeah, some jobs do not work online some people just don't work online you know like some people just don't work online. Yeah, exactly yeah, exactly and especially like some things people have made things work that made people think that this can be done online but it's like they made things work at dumb odds in a really uncomfortable way. Yeah, and at the expense of their mental health because they're thinking that it's temporary. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like, most things, most jobs probably cannot be replaced. And it, what, what was it like? Even super dull office jobs. You were saying that, like, there's simply less productive because they're not in the office environment anymore. They don't go to the office to work there. It's like people study in a library for a reason instead of their own room. Yeah, and I miss the library now, so much. Mm -hmm. I think certain jobs mm -hmm. and certain people work very well remotely, though. Yeah, some people do. So I feel like if there's flexibility for things to be remote, but not, you know, like everybody's brain works differently. Everybody functions differently. Everybody needs different things to be successful. So if instead of expecting that everybody fits one particular mold, mm -hmm we allow people and enable people to access what they need in order to be most successful, mm -hmm. that'd be pretty chill. Cause then we'd have a way more productive society. 
people would be a lot happier. People would feel a lot more fulfilled. I have a lot of feelings about this. I just <laughs> want to throw in a plug here for the universal basic income real quick. That's all. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, as good as this conversation is, anything else on <laughs> the frog? <laughs> The only other question that I had was haiku come from like a Zen Buddhist tradition, right? Haiku comes from a Buddhist tradition. The this version is influenced heavily by old like shamanistic Hinto rituals. Like this version has not like you know, this structure. <laughs> it's like how do I say it? it's Buddhist by origin, I think. But the Japanese manifestation is extremely Shinto focused, which is everything's a god religion. Everything has a god. Everything is a god. So it's like if you are Japanese and you were brought up with absurd tales of storks coming into your house and weaving you clothes and they turn out to be beautiful women, but they're also storks. Like all these supposed to have a very long literary meaning every single word in a haiku at least the famous ones but i mean frankly 99.9999 percent of them are lost on me <laughs> yeah i think that what i really like about japan specifically but cultures that have been around literally like forever um and are still around is it's like there is so much depth and like mm. you could just keep digging forever as a foreigner and like never reach the bottom of it like there's yeah. so you as a Japanese too. person, keep digging. It's not going to help you. Yeah. Um, you go a couple hundred years before, you won't be able to read it. <laughs> I, feel like adding the, I feel like adding the Shinto layer to the frog haiku also adds, like, like this frog has a spirit, and the pond has a spirit, mm. and their spirits are interacting in this way. Mm-hmm. And when they these two spirits meet, there's noise and mm-hmm. action and then mm-hmm. silence right mm. right i do like that and it's almost like a princess monarchy kind of the only <laughs> let's not go down any rabbit holes that's the frog for you that's the frog and they're not as short as i thought they were going to be <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> oh, no. that's all <laughs> all good it's very good 